All right, everybody. Well, let me also go ahead and welcome you all to church today. I know I've already said hello to everyone here at the Alton Darby broadcast location, but anyone who's either worshiping online or if you're in the room at one of our other campuses, man, I'm so glad that you could be in church today as well. Uh, We're going to get into week two of Dream Chasers, uh, but before we do, I want to give you a word of encouragement and a reminder. And I'm sure a lot of you, uh, if not all of you, have seen some of the events that continue to transpire yesterday with just the unrest in Israel and over in the Middle East. And what I wanted to do, since we're all together in this moment, uh, is just offer a reminder. And the reminder is that at Cyprus, we've made a commitment to pray for Israel and all of the situations there, but it's really not just Israel. It's really innocent people and families and lives all over the world, no matter what country they're in. And as God's church, I was just, as I was reflecting last night and praying myself, I was so grateful that our hope is not in breaking news alerts or the lack thereof, but it truly is in the name of Jesus. And we believe even when, even when we have questions and we wonder why would it be happening this way or what, what's going on, we continue to trust and believe that God is the master of the universe. He has the perfect plan for us. And even though we don't understand it, we continue praying for everyone over there here at Cyprus. And so again, just wanted to offer that encouragement, that reminder. Uh, and what I want to do now is I want to turn our attention to week two of Dream Chasers. And this is a brand new series uh, that we just kicked off last weekend. Pastor Ken did an incredible job just really laying the foundation and kind of setting the groundwork for where we're going. And at the end of the day, this series is really all about the dreams that we either used to have and we lost somehow, or it's about the dreams that we we need to start dreaming again. And he really explained some of the foundational components of a dream. Uh, And this week, what we're going to be looking at is how do we actually start taking steps to achieve those dreams. Now, to set up the conversation this weekend, What I want to do is I want to drop you into a fascinating conversation that took place almost 2,000 years ago. And this is in John chapter 1. And just to give you a little bit of context, what's going on? And Jesus Jesus is just about to start his public ministry. And so one of the first things that he had to do was he hit the recruiting trail to find some other men who later became known as the 12 disciples that he was going to start this journey with. He needed to find a team. And so what he did is he would have different conversations with people. He met a guy named Philip, who he had a conversation with. Philip said, yep, I'm in. I want to be one of your guys. And then what Philip did is he ran along to another town and got his friend Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel was a little bit skeptical at first when Philip was explaining everything to him. He was just hanging out under this fig tree, not really doing anything. But eventually, Nathaniel's like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So Nathaniel and Philip both come back to find Jesus. This is a conversation then between Jesus and Nathanael in John chapter 1. And if you pick it up with verse 47, it says, As they approached, Jesus said, looking at Nathanael, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus replied, he said, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you that I had seen you under this fig tree? He said, you will see greater things than this. Jesus' response is essentially like, my brother, you, you have not seen anything yet. All right? And, that, and that's the Pastor Jackson translation. You can't find that anywhere but here. <laughs> really and truly, the, P, the PJT. But when Jesus says this to him, he says, you're going to see a whole lot greater things than this. Jesus had incredible plans for Nathaniel. He had dreams for Nathaniel to chase. He had things he was going to experience. But what it required of Nathaniel was to change his life a little bit. He was going to have to start following Jesus. He was going to have to start new habits. He was going to have to start doing things every day to experience what Jesus was talking about. And it's true for all of us, no matter what our dreams are. What I want to explain this weekend, if you go on to the next slide, is that my dream and your dream is within reach by doing small things every day, starting today. My dream and your dream, it is within reach by doing small things every day, starting today. And in week two of Dream Chasers, what we're gonna do is we're really gonna dig into what are these small things that we're talking about. This weekend is all about the how. How do we actually do this? And one of the things that the entire teaching team at Cyprus uh, really makes a priority to do is we want our teachings to be applicable. 
meaning what we talk about on Sunday, we actually want you to be able to use on Monday. And I was thinking about all of the teachings and the messages I've given at Cyprus. This honestly might be one of the most practical, applicable teachings that I've ever given. And what I'm going to do is I'm really just, I, I went through the Bible this week and tried to figure out what are like the five different steps that we could actually take as we try to achieve our dreams, dreams together. And so that's what we're going to do. Five different steps. If you're taking notes, we're going to start with number one. And here it is. Number one, it's not even necessarily something you need to do, but it's a question that you need to ask. And you, you need to ask yourself before you start chasing your dream, does this dream really matter? Does it matter? And the reason I say that is because we're living in a world today with more opportunity than ever before. Whether it's to switch jobs, to start a podcast, uh, to move out of state, like, like well, whatever, there's so many options and opportunities. Therefore, we need to identify on the front end, is this really something that matters in this life? I came across this fascinating quote a few weeks ago that I wanted to share. And it says that the, the greatest danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. And this isn't some famous theologian. This is Michelangelo, who was a famous uh, Italian artist. But I think it's very true if we take this quote and we put it into our church world as well, because they have this fear that there's a lot of Christians that are going to end up accomplishing a lot of dreams and hitting a lot of goals, only then to look back over the course of your whole life and the grand scheme of things that really matter and realize that what you actually accomplished was fairly insignificant. Uh, did you know that there's only two things in this world right now that the Bible says are going to last forever? Out of everything that we interact with and experience, there's two things that the Bible says will last forever. The first one is God's word. And this is in Isaiah 40 where the prophet is writing and he reminds us that the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God, it stands forever. What God's word placed value on 2,000 years ago still has value today, and it will still continue to have value in our future. Life's going to change. Circumstances are going to change. Things are going to change. God's word, y'all, it will never change. So to ask myself, does my dream really matter? One thing that I have to ask in order to understand that is, does my dream align with the word of God? If it doesn't, then you'll get to the end of your life and you'll probably be like, yeah, that really, that wasn't worth the time I spent investing in it. The second thing the Bible says that will last forever, it's people. It's you and I, it's our family, our friends, the people we work with, our neighbors. So a second question to ask then after you ask yourself this is if my dream is accomplished, will it add value to other people? We, we, we want our dreams to matter, so these are things that we have to ask ourselves. Will it add value to other people? And I will say, most, most dreams, they will, as long as we reframe them the right way. And what I mean by that is you could have a financial goal that could be selfish, or it could be, could be life-giving to other people. And if your goal is either like to get out of debt or to save a certain amount for an emergency fund, you could say, I have a financial goal because I just want to be set. I want to be comfortable. I want to be able to live my own lifestyle that I want. Or you could say, I want to set a financial goal so that I can get to a place in this life where I can bless other people, I can be generous to others, to my church, and I can leave a legacy that's going to go far beyond me. So asking yourselves these questions helps to figure out, is this really worth chasing? So step one isn't necessarily doing something, but it's really sitting down and asking yourself the question, does this really matter? Now, once you check the box on number one, you can move on to step number two. And number two is once you decide, yes, this is something that matters, it's something I want to invest in, what you have to do is you have to add fuel to your dream. That's number two, is add fuel to your dream. Uh, you could have the most incredible looking car or boat or motorcycle or whatever you want, but if you don't have fuel, then it's going to sit in your garage and just collect dust all day. And the reality is that that same thing is true for our dreams. You have to actually add fuel. If it matters, then I need to put my personal fuel into the dream. Okay, what, what is my personal fuel? I asked the team to put together this graphic to kind of explain this step number two. Everybody has some sort of a dream in your life. 
whether it's to get a certain job, whether it's to get a degree, whether it's to start a family, whatever your dream is, we all have that. There is a financial reality to whatever your dream is. Whatever it is, money is going to be part of it. Uh, I'll, I'll use myself an ex as an example. A dream my wife and I have had is to have a family. And it's, it, we're not quite there yet. July's coming quick, but you all never warned me. There's a financial reality to having a child. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they're feeding them ribeyes and daycare or what, but you all, it, I mean, it's expensive everywhere. I mean, there, there, there's so many things like this is just how the world works. And, and Jesus was teaching in the New Testament. And by the way, this is what he taught about more than anything else was money. It wasn't heaven and hell and other issues. It really was money. And it's in Matthew 6 where Jesus is teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. And he says, wherever your treasure is, your money, there the desires of your heart will also be. He connects money with your dream. He says, wherever you invest yourself financially, at the end of the day, that's what matters most to you. That's what you're going to be chasing. That's what you're going to be pursuing. And so just recognizing that once I have my dream, in order to put fuel into it, this is going to be something that I have to do. Mapping out how much is it going to cost, what's it going to look like. Uh, there's two other resources that we have to put towards it. And it's not just money. A second one is our time. There, there's going to be an investment of your time when you're pursuing whatever God has for your life is. And time is a funny one because I, I would probably still view myself uh, on the younger side of the age demographic, like when you just look at uh, probably just like the general workforce or, or pe all the people that attend Cyprus, I'd probably still be on the younger side. Uh, but what's funny is I've had enough conversations with people that are a little bit older than me or older leaders, and time is something where our perception on it drastically changes as we age. Can anyone agree with that? Yeah, everyone's saying, I can even remember back when I was in high school, like that was, like time just flies by as you get older. But the reality is whether you are a high school student or you're retired, we all have two things in common, and it's that our time is limited and our time is diminishing. By the time you walk out of this worship center, you will be 60 minutes closer to dying than when you walked in. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> you, I mean, you, you, you would have missed out on hearing that. But it's just a reminder that time is a limited commodity. And when you think about the dreams that you want to chase for your life, you actually have to put together a map and put together a schedule and say, where am I going to invest time to make this happen? Now, the third one, it sounds very similar to time, but it's a little bit different, and it's your personal energy. How much energy you have every day. If you are awake for 16 hours in a day, you do not have 16 good hours of every day. You have time, but then you also need to figure out where am I going to invest the best hours of my day? There were times in the New Testament where Jesus would be teaching and he'd be, he'd be ministering to the crowds. He would have time if he wanted to stay there, but he didn't have the energy. So he would withdraw from the crowds. He would spend time with his father. He would get his energy back up and then he'd be able to go actually chase his dreams and do what he was made to do again. And so just getting real practical for a minute, if you are someone who you're home by 5 or 6 p.m. every day, and your goal is to rebuild your relationship with your wife or your kids, but you don't have any energy, and all you can do is just kick your feet up and watch Bachelorette or Sports Center, or whatever it is, you got to figure out, how am I going to replenish my energy so I'm not just giving time to this dream, I'm actually giving the best of what I have. Does that make sense? There's three areas. It's your money, it's your time, and it is your energy. And when all three of these things become aligned, something incredible happens. Now, this past Monday, you all, we got the opportunity to experience something pretty cool. It was the solar eclipse at all of our campus locations. If you got to experience the solar eclipse, raise your hand, raise it high. And okay, I would say most people, there's a few that didn't. And did you even look out a window? Like raise your hand, if you at least, if you at least looked out a window, raise your hand and saw the solar eclipse. Okay, that, there's more people that did that. But what's funny about this solar eclipse is it's something that, I mean, it doesn't happen very often at all. And I knew I was teaching this weekend. And so I made the decision early in the week. I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna use that as an illustration, all right? There's gonna be pastors and preachers all over the country this weekend. It's kind of basic and cheesy. I was like, I'm not gonna use it. And then I started working my way through the week and it was Thursday morning uh, before I gave this for the first time at the Alton Darby campus. 
And I was like, this is too good not to use. So I, 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 I'm going to use it real quick. But before I do, and I'll keep this short, I, I do owe some of you an apology with the whole solar eclipse. And the reason is because I've been a little bit of a solar eclipse hater over the last few weeks. All right. I, I, as, as I heard that like schools were taking off and people were taking off work, I just had this gut feeling. I was like, I hope that it's worth it. But I had a feeling we were going to be a little bit underwhelmed. But I told my wife and I told people, I said, if this is legit, like I had people telling me I was going to see stars and like streetlights were going to turn on. I was like, if that happens, I'll, I mean, I'll raise my hand. I was wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. Well, you all, I was wrong. That was, that was pretty awesome. And what my wife and I did is we, we ended up, we went on a walk in our neighborhood and we had our glasses and we would periodically look up and see it. Uh, and what we were doing, because we had talked about it the days leading up to that, but she asked me again, she's like, so tell me, like, what, what exactly is happening? And uh, since I paid attention in science class, I was able to explain to her, I said, what happens is the moon circles the earth, right? And then the earth circles the sun. And every once in a while, not often, but every once in a while, all three line up and something incredible happens, what we experience today. So I want to take you back to our graphic now. When all three of these things line up and it becomes perfect, something incredible happens. And what that is, is your dream turns into your plan. It's no longer just a far-fetched dream of something I'm going to try to do one day. You actually have a plan now and you can start pursuing your dream. Once you have a plan, you all, this is where it completely changes. And this is such an important step, step number two, to think about how am I actually going to add fuel to this before I start building whatever it is that I'm going to build. And th there's a biblical principle here when Solomon was teaching in Proverbs, and he said to do your planning and prepare your fields before building your house. Get all your resources in order, figure out what you're going to do, and then you can actually set out to build your house and to accomplish your dream. So step number one is to ask yourself the question, does it matter? Number two is you got to add fuel to fuel your dream. The third one, and this is so important as well, the third thing that we have to do as we pursue our dreams together is we've got to pay attention to people. I cannot accomplish the dreams that God has put on my heart without people. All right, And you cannot accomplish the dreams that God has put on your heart without other people. And when you ask yourself, okay, well, what are the other people in my life? Like, who should I be paying attention to? There are people who are, who are way smarter than I am, who have gone through all of the Bible, like from cover to cover, and tried to just ask the question, like, what, how should we prioritize relationships in this life? Like, who are the people that should get the most time, get the most energy? What, like, who are they? And looking through all of the Bible, looking at different doctrines and different verses and everything, most people agree that this is pretty much the priority list, and it'll look a little bit different depending on the season or stage of life that you're in right now, but the one thing that's true is number one relationship for all of us, you all, it, it truly is God. God is going to help you do things that no human on this earth will ever be able to do. And so you have to remember as you chase these dreams to prioritize your relationship with him whether it's church on the weekends, whether it's time with him in the mornings, time with him at night, you've got to prioritize the number one relationship in your life. And if you're married, second, it, it has to be your spouse. Third is your kids. And then fourth is what most people define as close relationships. And if you're, you're older, this could be parents, this could be siblings, this could be your small group. This is your, your, your close circle of friends that you do life with on a regular basis. And a, a, just a little disclaimer that I want to throw in in the middle of this teaching. As we pursue the dreams that God's put on our hearts and in our lives, we can never lose the priority of this list. Because I've seen way too many people and have had way too many conversations already at just this stage of my ministry career with different people that have gotten so focused on achieving certain things that they look back at their lives at the end and they realize that the most important things, the relationships, they completely abandon. So as you pursue these, make sure that this list always stays in its right priority. And as you have them in the right priority, you can then get the most out of each of these areas. God, your spouse, your kids, and then close relationships. Now, what I want to spend a little bit extra time talking about is close relationships. Because it is the area that all of us are in. And when you look at all four of those areas, it's the one where, where we have the most choice. 
it's important when you actually think about who are the people that I want to surround myself with. Because in your close relationships, this is the place where you're going to find coaching, you're going to find encouragement, you're going to find accountability. And in the church world especially, there is a, there's a major emphasis placed on accountability in relationships. And, and, and I want to be sure to communicate clearly, and you hear me on this, I think accountability is so, so important. But I also think that as we're pursuing the dreams that God has for our life, we have to understand that those close relationships don't just provide accountability, they also provide encouragement. It's so easy to get discouraged when things don't go the way that we thought they would. But this is where you find all these different things. And there's really the perfect example of what these close relationships look like in the Old Testament. And what I want to do is I want to share with you a story that took place in the book of Exodus. Uh, and it's, no, it's an event known as the Battle of Rephidim. All right, the Battle of Rephidim. Uh, it's probably a relatively unknown passage of the scripture. Uh, but just to kind of explain what's going on, Moses is leading the Israelites. And they had just crossed the Red Sea. They were kind of wandering all around in the wilderness. They were just running into different issues while they're in pursuit of the promised land. And Moses is still the one leading the Israelites, but he's in a little bit of a leadership transition where he's starting to equip a guy named Joshua with a lot of different responsibilities. And what Moses told Joshua, he said, hey, I, I'm still leading. We're, we're about to enter into a battle against the Amalekites. He said, I need you to take our army and I need you to be the one to lead them into battle. He said, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be watching from up top, but I need you to be the one. So Joshua rallies the troops. He goes into battle and, and they're fighting like, in this valley and Moses, like the head honcho leader, he's watching everything from up top. And something interesting happens and I don't know how Moses discovered this, but Moses realized as he's watching this battle take place that when his arms are just down by his side, the Amalekites were winning. But then when Moses would, would raise his arms and he would lift them up, then the Israelites would start winning. And so somehow he realizes that and he does what any great leader would do and he just, he just sticks his arms up. And he, he's holding his arms up, uh, but he runs into a problem. Because I don't know if any of you have tried to hold your arms up for like 10 hours at a time, but you get a little bit tired. And if you pick up the passage, that's exactly what happens in Exodus 17, where it says that Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until sunset. And as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. You all, these are the friends that we need in our lives. The, I mean, these are the people that you've got to do whatever it takes to find them. People that are literally going to hold your arms up, that are going to speak life into you when the battle's going on. It's nice to have friends that you can go out to lunch with and go on vacations with and, and do fun things with. That's important. But the reason that God has given us these relationships is for situations like this, when you need people. In fact, Solomon wrote in Proverbs when he talks about these close relationships, he said, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born when? Not when things are nice. A brother is born to help you in your time of need. Those are the people that we all need as we pursue the dreams that God has for our life. And the good news that I have for you today is that the local church is God's perfect plan for us to find these relationships. And if you have not gotten to a place yet where you've found relationships, I mean, I could not encourage getting started more than I ever have before. And if you have questions, either talk to your campus pastor, stop by next steps after service. It's next weekend, but at the end of the day, the church is incredible but the church with relationships was God's design for us to find this. And so again, number one, ask yourself the question. Number two, add fuel. Pay attention to people. We've got three down and two to go. Here's number four. Number four is to review on a regular basis. You have to figure out what are the areas of my life that I'm going to review and actually track progress on a regular basis. Now, th this is something that I've studied a little bit over the last couple years, and I've looked at either different pastors or different leaders, and th the specific things in their life that they review on a regular basis. And th there's not like a hard and fast rule to this, but the principle is you have to be intentional about areas in your life that you're reviewing. And what I wanted to do is I just wanted to share my list 
of the, the, the six areas of my life that I review once a month, and it literally takes me 15 minutes. There's six different areas, but it's just asking myself the question, God, how is my spiritual life? How, am I spending time with you every day? What does that look like? Uh, what about my emotional life? How am I processing emotions over the last month? Whether it's joy, whether it's pain, whether it's frustration, my social life, my relationships with, with my wife, with friends, my vocational life, my physical life, and my financial life. And just realizing that this isn't the perfect list, you can come up with your own, but the principle is being intentional and doing it this way. This is the step, reviewing is the step that really can turn inspiration in the moment uh, to like sustain, sustain success for the rest of your life. And this isn't just my idea, Th this is God's plan, this is God's principle for our lives. And I'll give you an example of this in the New Testament. Paul, who's probably the second most famous person besides Jesus, was teaching a younger man, Timothy, uh, a lot of what achieving his dreams was gonna look like. And Timothy was a younger man in the faith who was watching Paul, and he said, I, I, I wanna be a minister just like Paul. And Paul was teaching him and coaching him and giving him different tools for things that he was gonna be able to use to succeed. And one of the things that Paul said to Timothy one time, it was fascinating, when Paul was writing, and it's in 1 Timothy 4, where Paul says to him, he says, give your complete attention to these matters and the things I've told you, throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Progress is a biblical principle to be able to track and review. And this fourth step of reviewing areas of your life, this is what moves you from trying to tracking. I'm no longer just trying to reach these goals and like throwing darts blindly. I'm actually gonna be tracking. What do I need to do? What have I done? What can I do to honor God with my time and all the resources he's given me? And from here on out, really all you do is you just work your system. You continue to do the same thing day after day after day and trusting that God has the perfect plan. And it's crazy what happens then is you look back over the long course of your life and you say, man, I was consistent in the little things. I started doing small things every day and now this is where I am today. Uh, something funny that happened just a few weeks ago, I, I was over at my parents' house and it's the same house that I grew up in. And I, I, I was over there and, and there was different uh, people outside getting some work done. And I was looking out at these trees and I thought to myself, and I didn't just think it, I actually asked my dad, I said, did you get new trees? Like the, the, these pine trees that I remember being so small were massive. And he looks at me like I'm crazy and he just says, no. And I was like, I was blown away. But what happens is every single day, if you do the right thing, if you give it the right nutrients, it's just time happens and you look back and you accomplished your dreams. Now, I told you there's, there's five different pieces to this teaching. We've covered four of them. And I think these first four uh, are very important. But I've been praying all weekend uh, that this fifth step would especially resonate with some of you. And here's the fifth and the final piece to the, this whole message. It's to develop an unwavering belief that God will make it happen. As God's people, we're gonna do our part, but we have to develop an unwavering belief, you all, that God will make it happen. Up until this point of the teaching, it's a lot of good content that comes from the Bible, but there's part of you that could also say, this sounds like something I could almost get from like the self-help section at Barnes & Noble. Like what is, what's the secret sauce? What, what, what's different about what we talk about versus what you could find out there? It's that we believe that God, just like Pastor Ken said in week one, God has the perfect plan for our lives. We're gonna work our systems. We're gonna start new habits. We're gonna do everything that we need to do, but we're gonna develop an unwavering belief that God will make our goals happen. God will fulfill our dreams. And it's fascinating that human beings we can really handle an enormous amount of frustration and pain and delay, but as long as we have hope. Once people lose hope, that's generally when they kind of throw in the towel and give up. And what I want you to know this weekend is that your hope, you all, it's in Jesus Christ. Your hope is not in your ability to fulfill these first four steps. We're gonna do it, we're gonna trust, we're gonna believe 
but we have hope. And this is what Jesus taught when he came and people were blown away because he said, I'm offering you an eternal hope that's not rooted in the economy, that's not rooted in politics, that's not rooted in your ability to get stuff done. It was a radical concept. And so for the person who's going after your dream, going after your goal, but you're getting frustrated, what I want you to know is that your problems, they won't last forever. Your current job search, it will not last forever. The frustrations you've walked in with today, it will not last forever. The coronavirus pandemic, you all, we're back. It did not last forever. The political turmoil, like it, none of this stuff is going to last forever. And one of the things that King David wrote in the Old Testament that as I've been reading recently, this has just been a verse I've continued to go back to. And when I'm in those seasons of frustration and seasons when I don't know what's going on, I wanna encourage you, and for some of you, you need to make this your life motto this week. And it's in Psalm 27, where David wrote, and he said, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of the living. This isn't something I have to look forward to one day when I die. This isn't something years down the road. I am confident. I have an unwavering belief that I'm gonna put in the work, but God will make it happen. And so let me encourage you this weekend by saying that he who called you, he is faithful and he will also bring it to pass. And as you put in the work and as you start to see success and as you start to see God's favor and God's blessing in your life, just keep doing it every day. Keep doing what you know you need to do because what, what God would tell you is my brother, my sister, you haven't seen anything yet. I love getting to chase our dreams together. Do not miss next weekend as Pastor Ken brings us the first of the two most important characteristics for us to develop as we chase our dreams together. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask everyone at all of our campus locations, if you would stand right where you are, you can go ahead and stand on up and I would love to pray for you this morning. And so let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for this opportunity that we have uh, to study your word and to understand so practically, Lord, the steps that you've given us to achieve our dreams. I pray, Lord, for every person that's either in the room or watching online, I ask, Lord, that you would give them clarity and assurance of whatever those next steps are for them to chase. I thank you for the dreams that you've put on our heart, God, no matter how big or no matter how small they may be. And I pray, God, that that clarity would lead to courage and confidence as we take steps to pursue the best that you have for our lives. And above all else, God, allow us to develop that unwavering belief that you know us, that you love us, and that you have the perfect plan for the future of our lives. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen.